Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to the second lecture of our Berlage keynote series. Uh, on behalf of our Director of Studies, uh, Salomon Frasso, I would like to introduce uh, Uri uh, Gilad. Uri Gilad, co-founder and partner at Office Vimhof, uh, focuses on renovating and extending buildings of special historical significance, sustainable housing, and multifunctional projects at the intersection between hospitality, culture, and commerce. Developed with a careful understanding of context and an in interest in material presence, his work incorporates the environmental, social, and cultural dimensions related to architecture and city planning. Uri graduated from the Amsterdam Academy of Architecture, where he obtained his master's cum laude under Professor Hermann Herzberger. In 2016, he was nominated as a young architect for the Abe Bonema Prize, and in the same year received the ARC 16 Ouvre Award for the work of Office Winhof. From 2021, Uri holds the position of architect member of Committee One, City Center, of Amsterdam Special Quality Committee, and is one of the editors of the Yearbook Architecture in the Netherlands. Thank you. <laughs> yes, can you hear me, first of all? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, um, thanks for the invitation for the lecture. And actually, that was an opportunity to kind of make an experiment. So I hope this experiment will work today when we finish this lecture. Because I actually never gave a lecture about six projects in Amsterdam. Uh, but I thought that we live in an era that, that probably all of you already seen more than 100 pictures on your phone today of buildings. Uh, that it's a little bit interesting to show a different angle on architecture. And instead of spreading it into a very wide kind of field to really focus on one place. Um, the reason for Amsterdam obviously is the place where our office is, uh, but it's also the place where I live. Um, and it's also a place where we are being working for quite some time. <clears throat> um, before I start to talk about the six projects, I'll start with this image. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's the name of the school, obviously. Uh, but it's also my view. It's what I see every day. And behind Berlache, which is standing there and guarding his plan, overlooking his bridge, there is the Volkerkrabber, which is the first skyscraper of Amsterdam, which is also my home. Um, obviously, we can have a whole lecture about uh, Amsterdam South and the development of it, of the plan of Berlache, which I'm not going to do today. But what is interesting in this skyscraper which is actually not built by Berlache, although he really wanted to do it. It's built by Stahl, which was, in my opinion, the client decided to take Stahl because it was even more modern than Berlache, uh, which was the first skyscraper of Amsterdam with two lower buildings. So in total, it's 309 houses. Only 24 are in the tower. <clears throat> in front of it, there is a big square, which used to be called the Daniel Wildplein. And it was built in a period of a financial crisis, which is not different from everything we see always as architects. And a lot of immigrants from Germany and uh, other Eastern European countries before the Second World War actually moved and started to inhabit this neighborhood, which people didn't really want to live there because apartment buildings and stuff like that was completely different context. Well, Obviously, if we look, I can talk about the architecture of the building, which I'm not going to do today, but we can also look at what happened around that building. The picture on the left, there's three little girls posing in front of this tower with actually even a smoke coming from the top. The girl on the right, this is Anna Frank. She used to live in that project. She lived in number 37. Um, this is taken 10 years after the project was done, just a few years before the war. Um, her house was transformed actually after the war and was used by, I don't know if it's still today, but by poets, refugee poets could use their house. On the right, just in front, when Berlache is now uh, overlooking his plan, uh, that's where they collected the uh, Jewish inhabitants from the, neighbor, from the neighborhood, from the area, and they've been deported uh, into the camps. And the street where Berlache is looking so proudly at, which is called now the Freedom Boulevard, used actually to be called the Stalin Boulevard. Um, you're probably asking yourself, what is this to do with a lecture about architecture? Um, 
But obviously, there is a lot to do with it. And uh, obviously, when you look on the city, on the context of the historical city or the European city, where we normally operate as an office, you can talk about the building, you can talk about the architecture, but you can also talk about what happens actually around this building. What does it mean for the inhabitants? What does it mean for the city for the long term? This idea of the Stalin land, for example, is completely erased. Most of the people don't even know that actually that used to be the name of the street. Um, and um, it makes quite a direct link, of course, to the first project that I would like to introduce um, today, which uh, I try to give each project a little bit of a title. It doesn't mean it's an official title. I'm going to talk about six projects in total. Four projects are realized already. Uh, two projects are under construction, this one and the last one. And five of the projects are actually existing building and transformation, and only one is new. Most of our work, or at least a lot of our work, is about transition of existing building, transformation of building. We try as much as possible to focus on the relation between the building and the place and what's happening there. So obviously, this seeking the balance, what I gave as a title for this lecture, I hope that at the end of the lecture it will make some kind of a sense. Um, <clears throat> this picture was taken in 1948. It's just two years, uh, oh, sorry, more than two years, three years after the war. Um, this is uh, the zoo of Amsterdam. Uh, still today is the zoo. This is the Plantage Bird. And in this neighborhood, uh, which used to be uh, a Jewish neighborhood at the time, there was a theater here and a school just behind it. Uh, the theater on the right, this picture is taken in, in my, I think, 1943, uh, let's say during the war. This theater was used actually uh, by the Nazis. That's where they collected uh, the Jews. And from there, they were deported. In front of it, on the other side, there was a school. And Actually, together, they make quite an interesting story of the past. I will come to it in a minute. This is the current situation. Obviously, they changed tremendously as a building. On the right, it is a monument, which was uh, changed many times during the years. On the left, it wasn't really used as a school for years. It was kind of an office that was extended during the years. This is a sketch that we made when uh, we were asked to participate in a competition. And what was very interesting about it is that we said everything already happened here. So you don't have to invent anything of the history. You just have to actually make an architecture that tries to allow it to just be there. So our architecture is almost like a canvas for telling the story that was there instead of trying to be even as more important than what the place is. It's very often that in these kind of spaces, and you probably all know, reference of other projects like that in the world, I don't need to give names, they are very, very expressive. They, take, they are more important than it. And it was really nice that the design brief for us was we would like to make a white museum. We would like to make a museum. We called it in our words that it's almost like a canvas. Basically, the story, quite quick, is that they were all um, uh, collected in the... Uh, where is my pointer? all collected in the theater space, but there was no space for the young children. So they were put in a kindergarten out here. And at night, the 600 kids are put above this fence, and they took them out from the school. They got a new name, they got a new passport, and through that, they were saved. So basically, there are two stories here. There's a story of a very heavy story on the right side, and there's a story of actually uh, uh, um, yeah, a hope on the left side. Um, like I said, it used to be a theater. It was used by the war. After the war in the 1960s, it was in a really bad situation. They wanted to demolish it. And Lopen, the architect who did many uh, buildings uh, at that time, did also the Amstel Station, for example, that worked on, um, transformed it into a monument. Actually, very nice. His idea was very clear. He destroyed the wall behind it. He just opened it down on the bottom. It became almost like a park. It became an open building. Obviously, when we start normally, they don't look as beautiful as they are. I'll show you quite a lot of ugly pictures today. This is how the place was uh, when they asked us to uh, work on it. Um, our idea was to go back 
to Lopen? Because you can, how much back you want to go in the history? To which period would you choose to go? There were a lot of discussions about that. You could decide to go to the theater, you could decide to go to the war, but actually it was the idea, not by me actually, it was discussed by many levels, uh, to go back to the period when it became a monument, an official monument. And therefore the colors went back. We did the color research, we archived all the research, we found 29 layers of colors actually in the building, but we went back actually to the layers of Lopen from the 60s. We did the same for the back. The back where the theater used to be, the idea of the absence when the memorial is, was changed from grass that Lopen did. It was obviously grass didn't work there, the amount of rain in Andalena, I don't need to tell you about it. They closed it during the years, and then our idea was how could you actually make a uh, natural transition into what was there before. And in the inside, um, we tried to develop uh, this technique of how can you actually, because this was outside in the period of Lopen, it becomes now inside, so how do you transform a floor that used to be outside to inside? We actually, it's all handmade. These are tiles that are made by hand, then they are they put them on the floor, they put concrete in them, and then they polish them uh, in place. On the other side of the building, this totally understory. On the other side of the building is where the school used to be and where it's going to be the main uh, exhibition space of the museum. They call it in their words, on one side is the heart, on the other side is the brain. So this is where the brain is. As I said, the building was changed tremendously during the years. And what was important for us since the competition is not to try to historicize that, or not to try to fake this kind of idea in old school, but to actually just give a memory of a school. When people pass on the street, there is see this silhouette, and that silhouette tells us something about the history of the place. So we obviously changed it from this in the middle back to what it was on the left, but we chose to do it only with brick. All the expressions, all the decorations, everything went away. We had many, many talks, and Peter sits here in the crowd, in the, in the office of how deep do we need to go? Huh? What is the result? Huh? How do you do that? What is the expression? And how do you make sure that actually, although you make a very abstract interpretation of it, there is enough richness within it? It was very interesting to see that actually the people that built it, they found it fantastic. They for years didn't work back with this kind of technique. So they had to make everything from wood as arches. Each, each brick of the arch was actually shaped in a different size. The contractor was unhappy because it took much longer than they expected that it would take. But actually all these elements came together very strongly. And we made a very clear differentiation. The new brick, so what is new, is only heads of brick. So it's very clear that everything that is heads is on the top, and we didn't take the same bond as the bottom. Well, how do you make something in between two buildings? We had to make a new entrance, that part we wanted to change. So we started to look on architecture, Amsterdam architecture, done by architects from that period, Jewish architects from that period, actually, and looking on how these things were happening. And what we found out is these very beautiful buildings that have no uh, um, um, residential function, um, and uh, at least the, the one on the left, of course, and they still have the, some kind of language in the building. So we started to look on the historical proportions on the top, and try to, on one hand, enhance this proportion, on the same time make a very abstract building within that street. The back is where the story is, and unfortunately I cannot show you too much, so I'll be very short about it. But the idea was that when people come into the museum, the first thing they go is they go to this um, uh, air care in Dutch, I don't know how to say it in English, um, and that's where you look into the wall. Actually, there is no wall anymore, and there was never a wall. Nobody knows what this wall was. Aldo van Eyck built years ago on the left a project. He made a new wall in between, and for us, it's not really exactly that wall, but it's the symbolic idea of being in that place and looking to actually where all these 600 kids were moved, and that's where the museum is actually starting in. 
And what we took from Leopold from the other side, he wanted to create this transparency from the street all the way back to the inside. We actually did the same in this building. The idea is that once you enter the building, or even if you look from outside, this transparency, this idea of where the wall is, goes all the way to the back. So what I'll try to do is I'm not going to go in all aspects of all the projects, obviously, because then we will have to be here hours. I'll try to touch one aspect in each project um, that uh, relates to this idea of this duality, this search that we're doing, this balance that I'm talking about between, on one hand, um, making sure that we're looking, we are aware of the history of where the place we operate, on the same time, we take the freedom to actually, for renewal, because this, this, this idea of only keeping something is totally not what we want to uh, have as a result. And that one is obviously a very strong project in that. Um, I was trying to look on the archive, and this painting is from 1726, I think. Uh, this is on the right side, is the Trippenhaus. This is the, was for years the largest um, uh, residential house uh, in Amsterdam. It's built by the brother Louis and Hendrik Tripp which made a lot of money from weapons, uh, still very relevant. Um, and um, this building uh, uh, is one of the top 100 monuments of the Netherlands. It's a very important building. We can just have an hour lecture only on that building, which we're not going to do today. But this building also changed many times. This was the Rijksmuseum. Actually, the night watch used to be hanged here. was cut, actually, because it didn't fit into that building. Um, it used to be a part of the city hall, um, and it's for 200 years the house of the Royal Academy for Arts and Science. So all the Nobel Prize winners uh, or all the researchers are a part of it. When we started the project, it was Trippenhaus complex because the, the KNV, the Royal Academy of Arts and Science, they're not only sitting in number 29, but they are 31, 29, and 29, 27, 25, 23. So as you can imagine, it's a, it's a mix of buildings from many, many periods. The Trippenhaus is from 1662, so it's very old. goes all the way to a building from 1970s. Although it looks older, it's actually not that old. Our task was very, very small. You just need to make a public entrance. That's it. Obviously, it didn't end there. But what we needed to do is uh, almost... Uh, uh, unseen on the street side and very important inside. And that's often with our architecture, actually, when you work in the context of the historical city, is that what you're doing is very little to see on the front, but has a huge, it's almost like a world behind the facade. And, oh, this is really impossible to see. There's really a lot of light here. This is, the, <laughs> you have to imagine, uh, this is the Rembrandt Zaal, so this is still called the Rembrandt Zaal. This is where the Night Watch, uh, is it possible to turn the lights a little bit down? Uh, this is where the, uh, the Nachtwacht, so the Night Watch of Rembrandt used to be hanged. There's actually still Fernand and balls on the wall. Uh, it looks very original, very authentic, very important, and it is like that, but it was changed many, many times during the years, actually. Um, this is a, oh, much better. This is the Rembrandt Zaal. Still friend of all the wall. This is on the other side. It um, uh, used to be actually on the ceiling, the same painting as the Rembrandt's album. In certain period, they thought these ceilings are not interesting. Nobody wants to have them. They're too old. They throw them away. So you can imagine how complex these discussions are. This is, they say, where Einstein uh, presented his theory of relativity in the Netherlands. And this room was used as a part of the, uh, I don't know how to say it in English, but let's say as a, a public room of the city with all men, images hanged on the walls. All the spaces in the Trippenhaus had names of men. There was no any woman named in the building. And um, this is what we had to deal with. So I showed you these beautiful spaces, but this was the space we were given um, to make as the main entrance for the Trippenhaus. This was where people used to eat in the Trippenhaus. So you can imagine, obviously, when you find these two worlds together, it's always nice to show that when they call us, it's not necessarily for the nicest parts. This was the entrance. This is the entrance where all the goods came into the building. This is the public relation between the building and the street, because obviously the building on the right is completely closed, and you cannot change that. This is a drawing we made during the competition. 
where we drew all the floors of the Trippen House. Each room has a different floor. On the left, we drew our new floor. So our idea was to actually create an, what we call enfilade of rooms, just like the Trippen House, that you go from one space to the other because we need to have people to walk all the way from the entrance all the way to the valley to the end. We search every room, we built models, we looked on colors, we looked on references, everything obviously came from the existing building translated into the new. The ceiling in the existing building are all uh, painted with uh, relation to um, nature, mainly birds. So Effie Fingerling, she got the commission to actually draw the ceiling with, she drew, she chose nature in a very abstract way. This is the drawing that we ended with. It's a relation of spaces that every floor, wall, ceiling, all somehow relates to each other. And somehow every time we do a project, we try to do nothing, and we end with these kind of pictures, which I show you many more, which obviously you can imagine that you get a call from a client in normally stress that we said we're going to do the minimum, and we're ending up with this. But luckily, it ended up like that. All we wanted to do is just create the very simple spaces that are linked to each other. But in order to do that, we had to take a lot away from the building in order to have these kind of spaces that are all linked into each other. We drew every space, every floor. We did all the furnitures here. Everything was total design. And we made sure that what we learned from the whole building, we implement in the new, but in a totally different way. On the left is a drawing where it was made in the Rembrandt Saal when, of the Rembrandt room when it used to be the Rijksmuseum. On the right is obviously a picture of a space. The idea of the different colors, the idea of the, the way the light comes in, obviously comes from these things, but it's done completely different. We knew immediately when we started the project that we're not going to do wooden floors, for example. We're not going to do hard floors because it's totally different from each other. You can imagine that to transform an uh, auditorium, and we're standing here also in one, uh, we took some things from the Rembrandt Saal, these proportions, the idea of the divisions in the ceiling, the idea that the ceiling goes to the columns and the floors. And light was very, very important. How does light coming in to make sure that you don't enter into this darkness of a space? But as I said, and this is me standing there trying to think what we're we gonna do with this space, we were not allowed to move any walls, we were not allowed to change anything with the constructions. So it's quite of a challenge to try to translate it back into something that has another typology which reflects back into the Trippen House. The outside was also an interesting one. How do you make a very small facade to the street and how, what is material of this facade and Actually, why? Well, this painting is, as much as disturbing it is, uh, very happy angel babies are moving a uh, weapon in the sky. And it's drawn in the Trippen House. Uh, and uh, I cannot even start to explain how wrong this thing is. Um, it's what they made the money from. They used to make weapons. They used to uh, make, it wasn't bronze, huh? it was ice. it's called in Dutch. It was iron. But the idea of making this material, the idea of casting, was very important for us. So we changed the angels, angels with these silver-packed men, and we actually casted the facade. It's all bronze casted, nine millimeters thick. And we ended with a facade, actually, that is immediately not new. It's immediately kind of dirty, like the facade on the right. The stone of the building on the right, the Trippen House itself, is one that you're not allowed to clean, because if you clean it too much, you take the layer of it. So we knew that it will always stay a little bit working, and we looked for a material that has that. And also, for the first time, create transparency between the institute and the street. Also, we advised at that time, and I didn't do it to get alone, it's obviously with the people within the institute, to change the name of the rooms, because we created many room rooms to introduce female scientists as well in these rooms. And at the end, all these things changed as well within the building. Um, now, the next project is one that we just recently uh, um, uh, delivered. It just finished not so long ago and has a completely different challenge than maybe the ones that we saw for so far. Um, 
This is, for the ones that are familiar, this is the Oster Park, so the East Park of Amsterdam, that's above. Um, the problem was with the East Park of Amsterdam is that there were very big buildings built on the edge of the park, actually half of the park was built by these buildings that didn't fit in the center, and they allowed them to be built at the right. This is the Tropper Institute. This used to be, that's our building. The uh, university building the, for uh, the laboratorium for, um, um, yeah, how do you say, it? Uh, no, the laboratorium building. And the park was actually through these buildings that owned a big part of the park was actually only half of what it used to be. This is our building, the university building, um, where actually the anatomy, that was the anatomy research building. And this is a fantastic space where they used to actually store and expose, so that was a museum part within the building, all the skulls, the bodies, the research that they used to do. As I said, the park is, was a kind of a failure park in Amsterdam. Now it's one of the most, uh, in my opinion, at least successful parks in Amsterdam. For 15 years, they tried to double the park from being only this to have this. But these were all fenced things owned by the people that owned the building. This is a picture that we made in the first time we visited the site. I, I'm standing uh, there, just in the back. See, I'm Peter here. And, um, the task that we had is actually to change it from a building that neglecting the park, that is close to the park, that only facing the street. Obviously, it faces the park, but it doesn't have any role or uh, change nothing with the park, into a building that has two sides. It sounds easy to do, but it's quite hard. The ambition of the park was uh, very complex. All these red buildings, they were all closed and not really not connected to the park. So how do you do it? How do you embrace that idea? of connecting to the park. On the top right, this is the original design of the architect, Spink, that actually wanted to create these two arms with a belly in the middle. That's where the classes, the auditorium like we have here, used to be. During the construction, he had to add square meters, so he added this strange arm into the building, which gave us a lot of opportunity. Before we started, there was already a permit to build this big block in the middle of the building, which actually blocked the whole idea of the building in the relation to the park. Obviously, it was a very, um, maybe, uh, interesting uh, block, maybe with a beautiful facade. But it took away, of course, from the original idea of the building. So our suggestion was, instead of doing it here, just to doubling this, which was already changed during the years, and through that, to link the building much better into the park. So to create in a very natural way an extension in the place that already was extended before, and through that to allow the building to embrace the park much better. The end result is obviously um, a quite um, strong image between the existing and the new. We looked also, and I'm not going to go long into it, but we looked a lot about the existing proportion of the building that actually only had two floors, that's it, and a roof. So we wanted to give back this idea of two floors also in our building, although we needed to create, obviously, four floors within it. Like I said before, a lot of times in architecture, you don't see anything from the street. Obviously, if you cycle here along, you'll think it maybe was cleaned. But we didn't do much more than that. The only thing we did, which is very significant, is we kept this idea that you all the way from here can look all the way to the park. So this idea of the section is very, oh, is very, very important. And only what we did is because the architect turned the building 90 degrees and created a head here, we wanted to double this head. It's a very simple idea. How do you double the existing head? What we did is we also took the exactly existing measure of the brick, continued to our new building, but we used, obviously, a very modern brick. We used the Peterson brick, and we also had a party of um, form breaks. We had the possibility to do it. Sometimes there's budget limitations. And actually, that goes back to the beginning of the lecture. We worked a lot in Amsterdam School, in the area, in Berlageplan, to learn and to see how actually they created all this rich architecture, how they created a round corner going inside or outside. And how, did they use uh, form breaks or not? Obviously, they did. And we drew every brick, brick by brick, and 
Leon our, from our office was three times uh, a week on the building site during the construction to make sure that they understand these drawings, that they follow these principles. And we ended with a building that actually, on one hand, is architectural expression is very much related to existing building, but on the same time, through the proportions of the windows, through the use of the brick, through the expression of the brick, obviously relates to our time. The inside was also very important for us. How do you make two buildings connect together? I mean, you have many examples here in this building as well. We actually wanted to create a gap between the two buildings and to make sure that everybody can still touch the old facade. So the old facade is actually expressed inside the building and becomes a part of the architectural expression of it. On the bottom, we created a public restaurant. So it was very natural through this idea to move it to the side that the park is going into the building and also inviting actually the, um, everybody basically to go in. The entrance to this restaurant is from the park, is not from the hotel. Like I said, every time we have this image that everybody's in shock and you get this client call, this one is also one of them. Under this building, under this huge park with 32 new trees with 80 centimeters ground, there is a huge parking garage, there is back of house, there's offices, there's a whole world. So basically, this is above it. it you cannot feel anything from the bottom. There's no fence, there's no blockage, there's nothing. The park goes literally into the park. And to make it even more interesting, Thanks to the client, we work with Thijs van Siel, which actually is the architect that works a lot, landscape architect, with artists, the zoo, to integrate as much as possible here spaces for birds, other animals, etc. So all these red things, there's a lot of hidden stuff. There's a lot of idea of if you create something, make sure actually that you even take it one step further. We only finished just before the winter, so we didn't still have a real summer season, so it was never fully green, but obviously here you can see the image for the first time, how the idea of the doubling of the heads, how the building and how the park is actually literally coming all the way to the facade. Inside, yeah, everything was, except the corridors, that's the left pictures, were actually in bad shape. Everything was gone. Everything was taken, emptied. There was almost nothing to lift on. Again, we wanted to do very little, and we ended up with doing quite a lot. Um, we had to dig the whole building 60 centimeters to the bottom to stabilize it, but also in order to make the connection between the building to the park, to make a natural relation between the two, and also to gain all these areas on the bottom that could be actually functional. Inside, we restored the corridors, we restored the bricks, we cleaned them. Um, were needed, and we um, integrated all the installations, all the requirements of the hotel into the existing architecture with actually not interrupting it at all. And the beautiful uh, 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 main space that used to be the museum space that you saw was actually also not in the best shape. Water came in for many years. There was a lift built there. There was a staircase lift there, and we changed it, restored it, I work obviously together with Lindsay, the landscape, uh, the interior architect, um, to make the Grand Restaurant, which is also actually public. So, which means that people are actually enter the building and using this space still. I have three more projects. I hope you have energy. If not, I can skip uh, quietly. This is I'm going to show very short. I'm not going to talk too much about this project. I'm going to talk about one aspect of this project. I don't know how often in you will have this opportunity, but we were able to create an alley. We even could choose the name of the alley, but actually we chose an old name of the alley, original one. This is a picture of KLM of the center of Amsterdam, where you see here the first department store of Amsterdam, which used to be also the VND. This is a picture a few years before, where there used to be a church actually in that place. But modernity came, and uh, Caro came, and he, this, he made this uh, render by hand, obviously, um, and fake it completely. I mean, we are faking renders nowadays. He faked it. This alley that we have here between these two buildings is two and a half meters, is maybe three meters wide. He made the client feel like he's making this building with this alley of 10 meters in between. But he, he managed to convince them to demolish everything and to build the first department store of Amsterdam. 
And not so much later, 20 years later, modernity came, and Kaut made this render by hand, obviously, for the client when he demolished even more buildings than Caro already demolished and promised him a modern um, department store, which he actually built, but only partly. He never was able to complete it completely. Parts of Caro were remained. We actually, until today, don't know why. But you can see how the history went for this building. On the left is the original building by, oh, by Caro. In the middle is the first bridge that already connected to Jacot. And here you see how slowly, slowly, Kaut is eating Caron, and in a certain moment, stopping to bite him or eat him, or I don't know how you want to call it. Obviously, like I said before, when they call us, they look less nice, everything. What happened is obviously this phenomena of, of changing and eating and, and uh, developed during the years and ended with this kind of world of what is totally not clear uh, where you are, what you're doing. We made a very, very simple sketch to the client. We said, you need to do nothing. All you need to do is open back the alley, give each building its facades, and it's finished. Now, it, it is what we did, but um, there, there, there were some heavy moments in this building. I mean, this building is now floating completely. Um, you have to understand, in order to, to, to do nothing, Nowadays, you need to talk about sustainability, about energy, about a certain strength that the building had to have, otherwise no shop wants to go in. You need to talk about safety. You need to talk about all these subjects that we have to deal with today, which requires to, even when you don't want to do nothing, you have to change so much. Um, this was not in order to create a, a basement. We had a basement. It's not order to create. It's order to stabilize the building. It's order to have more weight possible on all the upper floors, and it's order to bring the building into the 21st century. Like I said, we wanted to do very little. All we wanted to do is to open the alley, create Laplace in this building, go back to Jacot, and in this building to create back the historical void that used to be in there, and to restore as much as possible Caron into Caron, and restore as much as possible Jacot, um, Caut into Caut. This is the void in the building, which actually allowed us quite quickly to change it from a building that didn't function on the upper floors, because obviously nobody wants anymore to go to the shopping mall on the third floor, to actually a very functional office building. The alley that we opened, St. Jorgsteeg, allowed to create an historical connection directly to the passage behind it, and actually created immediately a new address for the top part of the building. And we obviously, and I'm not going to talk about it because I have no time, changed all the facade, restored them, brought them back. Um, and through actually creating the alley, all of a sudden the depth of the building is much easier to access. And the, the shop even got even more facade than they had before because we could go all deeper on the corner. We saw, until now, quite a lot of, of historical buildings in different periods, from 1662, I think this one was in the beginning of the uh, uh, 20th century. But what happened with the young monuments? What happens nowadays with all these buildings from the 70s and 80s uh, uh, that we all hate? Um, what happens with all these buildings? I started with Berlache guarding his plan, standing there watching that no architect is touching his plan, and from... The plan of Berlacha is now an UNESCO monument. It's very highly respected. But a lot of plans and a lot of buildings from the recent years are totally not there. And we obviously live in a world that the change is much faster than it used to be, which means that we destroy these buildings because before we can even appreciate them. So we are more and more um, facing this question in the recent years. And I'll show you one. I'll do only two, but I'll show you one of them first. Uh, I found this picture fascinating. It's almost like a picture from Las Vegas somewhere. But this is actually the center of Amsterdam. This is taken from the Netherlands Bank, the Dutch Bank, which you can talk about the history of this building. It's a very important building from the city of Amsterdam. It used to be the palace for the Volkswagen, the palace for the people, let's say, for that. This was burned, and then they built the Dutch Bank. And we got a request to transform this building on the Frederiksplein. 
This building is by Arthur Stahl. He's the, young, the son of Jan Stahl that built the first Vulcan Krabber in Amsterdam. So it goes back again to the first pictures I showed you. That was his son. Before he built that building, there used to be two buildings there. One on the Utrechtse Straat, and the other one was into the Friesixplein. Stahl was a modern architect of the time, very modern architect. He took his father even further. So Stahl made a very modern sketch. He said, this is what I'm going to build for you, a glass, beautiful building. He went to Velstan, so he went to the Monument Committee. He presented his plan, and they told him, sorry, you're not going to build that. You will have to make two buildings. You have to look to the history, and if you want to make something new, you can do it only in one part. He wrote a letter, and I'm sorry, it's in Dutch. He wrote a letter to the committee, and he said to them, how can you expect from me to make a 1900, uh, I don't want to use the words, but terrible architecture? There's no way I'm going to do such a terrible architecture. But they didn't accept it, and then his struggle starts. And you can see the struggle of him to actually needing to look in, all of a sudden from being a very contemporary architect to cooperate the history in his architecture. He made first this sketch, where he tried to make a little bit of historical building looking on Utrechtse Straat, and then still his modern building at the end. And he ended up with kind of a merge of buildings that until today, for a lot of people, they are very not clear. You either love this building or you hate it. And obviously you can see that in, he did it quite beautiful, actually. He, in very elegantly, he connected the historical building by making a very small brick gerbil here. He connected the corner quite well, and he merged the two buildings together. They were changed tremendously during the years. Everything that was a little bit appreciated about them was gone. And actually, it wasn't a monument. Actually, a lot of developers were thinking to demolish it. Um, and um, why keep this building? When they came to us, they didn't expect us to do it, but we said, we're actually going to treat the front facade, and that's the picture on the left, as a monument. Oh, sorry. We're actually going to treat it as a monument. We're going to respect style. We're going to make a complete new facade, but we're going to respect it. In the back, we're going to make a new facade. We're going to solve the installations because the building is only 250 meter height. So actually, every office building would tell you that it's impossible to create office in this building. So every developer would tell you this needs to be demolished. And we make green for the neighbors. The facade outside, we obviously looked as much as possible back to the history to stall. And we created, obviously, a very sustainable building, but a facade that reflects the history and reflects the architecture of stall which I think you could love it. You don't need to hate it. It's pretty beautiful, the transition and the way he integrates the two buildings on the roof. But inside, we had 2 meter 50 height ceilings, 230 under the beams. How do you make a modern office in such a building? Well, the concept was very easy. We said you don't do any lower ceiling, any lower floors. You just make a box in the middle where you solve all the installations. And you make a box on the side where you solve the second part of the installations. Our commission was everything. We could do architecture, interior, furnitures, like we do in many of the projects in the last few years. And that's integration of all these elements allows you not only to think as an architect on the facade outside or how to solve a little bit the installation inside, but to really how to integrate it in such a complex building. So what you can see is we created this middle space where the old installations are there and where it's open, we have the maximum height of the building. The upper floor used to be looked like that. Um, it was clear that it's pretty much a, a nice floor. Arthur Stahl always made an expression of the roof in his architecture, at least in most of his buildings. We're working now in another building of him that was less of an expression. And this is where we put the public part of the company. So that is where the company restaurant is. We actually wanted to celebrate these windows as much as possible, to keep them as much as they are, and to just say, just enjoy them. The only original thing that left in the building was the staircase of Stahl. He used on the walls um, uh, a natural stone and travertine, which actually his father also used a lot. It's a part of that period. And we took that idea of travertine into our architecture, into the interior, into the new parts of the building that we created. What was very interesting that this client, our 
coming from a canal house. So they had this big canal house, and they moved into this kind of modern building. And the tasks and the questions they ask us is, can you create a building that on one hand feels representative, but on the same time is not overload? There's no historical feeling of the spaces. And we obviously ended up by actually trying as much as possible to use these windows, to use this very large proportion of style and integrate it into the building. This is the last project I'm going to show, and it's totally different than everything I show so far. Obviously, when we work in the European city, or in the context of the European city, and most of the things I said, they relate to existing building. How do you transform to existing building? What is the balance that you seek? How do you do that, etc. But what happens when you work with a new building? And what happens when you work with a new building in an area that is actually quite difficult nowadays, in opinions of some. This is, uh, well, it's translated in English into the Western Garden City, Westlake Town Staden in Dutch, um, which is obviously uh, what a lot of architects nowadays, when they're working on densifying cities, they get a, get a request to demolish a few of these, to make many more houses, to go higher, to go thicker, to change it. But there was a very interesting idea around these uh, neighborhoods. Um, the relation between apartments and green, the outside space. A lot of time the apartments are quite good, they are quite big. Um, and what happens is, and on the top left is the project we are working on, uh, they're densifying it either by adding an arm and a tower, but a lot of time you can see that they're densifying it, but actually changing the middle scale, making it fatter, higher, or adding towers. On the right is the ideal image, and that's where our site is next to it, of the garden city. Who doesn't want to live there? But on the left, and the building is still in the back, as you can see here, is what happened during the years. The green disappeared, the idea of the plane disappeared, a different scale was introduced, and then it's completely gone. So, this is the site of our project. Obviously, it's a very different picture than all these beautiful pictures I'll show you of the sites until now. So we need to build the tower just, just here, in front of this building, in this, in this area. How do you do it? What kind of architecture you make in this space? Um, what do you want to refer to? Um, and how do you at least try in some way to create some of continuation? And we did a research about the architecture of the area. And obviously, you can say that these photos are not the best photos, or these buildings are not maybe the best buildings, but they have quite an interesting character in all of them. The idea of use of material, the use of concrete, the idea of the balconies, the idea of the outer space, the proportions of the windows. Um, they are very, very different than the Berlage plan that we started at the beginning, but they have some kind of a character. So the tower we proposed, and this is a social housing tower, which will have, um, I think, 187 apartments out of my head. Um, it's actually, how do you continue this idea of the garden city? What is the expression of the balconies? What is the expression of the outer space? What kind of material are you using? How do you make sure that the tonic of the building is actually relates to this building, for example, that is next to us? For example, we made the phase five floors very strong horizontal line closed. We enhance this line in order to connect it to the two buildings, then we repeat it twice, and we end it with a crown on top. Now, obviously, I couldn't avoid using a picture looking from my house outside when the client said that what they want to do is they want to create small apartments, but with huge windows. Now, that was an amazing request, because what's happening, and maybe you all know this, because some of you may be living in these kind of apartments, there is a big trend to create 30 square meters apartments that are very narrow, three meter wide, very deep, 10 meter deep. It's kind of a cigarette boxes that are being done now. We got the request to do exactly the opposite, make a very wide apartment, very undeep, but that's impossible almost to do. Luckily, through working with the guy as a client, uh, uh, we managed to create these apartments. We created an apartment that are seven meter wide, 34, 33 square meters. Everybody has a balcony. Only on the back, they all have 
It's kind of French balcony because we're not allowed to build above the property of the neighbors. And we made a research for how can you, even in a small apartment, make sure that there is this difference between where I sleep, where I live, and how do you actually, the relation between the inside and the extension to the outside space. So we ended up with this idea of these balconies. We even looked on the railing to be relates to the railing of the historical buildings in the site. And we looked a lot on the materiality and expression of the architecture. This building is being built very soon. We're going to start next month to construction. All these buildings always get installations on the roof. The roof is one big installation party. We said it's social housing. Why don't we create four penthouses on the roof for social housing and put the installation inside the building? So we created four penthouses of 30 square meters for the lucky ones but we'll have a huge balcony outside, and we created two huge terraces for the whole inhabitants of the building on the roof with no installations. The installations are all inside. We put all the money in the bottom side of the balconies, not on the top. We said, this building, you express it from the street. You see it from the street. When you walk on the street, then you see a skyscraper. So the terrazzo is not where you walk on. It's going to be on the... When you look up from your balcony to your neighbor, it's going to be for us, for the people that live in that area. And obviously, we looked on the entrance. How can you make a relation between inside and outside? What is the role? Can you create a bench on the outside, which is a part of the building? Can you create a collective space for the inhabitants? And what is the relation between the building and the park that is going to be at the end? So I hope that with this, I got a little bit of you got a little bit of understanding of this balance and this idea of how we work, what we are looking for when we work on our projects. And obviously I would like to end with thanking my team, or our team, because Jan Petri is also here. Um, you guys are studying now, or some of you. You used to do a lot of things yourself. We do nothing ourselves. We do everything with the whole team that works in our office together, and obviously with many other people that involved in making these projects. And um, yeah, I think with them together, at least with our team together, we are still continuing and researching and asking ourselves continuously, what is the balance that we are searching when we're working on certain projects within the city? By this, I'm done. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Uri. Are there any questions Where you from the audience? There? Thank you for that great talk. And I guess my question also is kind of relating to your firm and the structure of your office. You had really a lot of great examples of how research impacted the projects. And I just would love to hear more about how how you got started in kind of research being fundamental to your firm. Is it specific to a project or is it something more overarching or underlying of the, the structure of the firm or how do you how do you go about that? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. I think if you ask it on my team, they will say that we don't research enough. We hear it very often. Um, uh, but obviously uh, I don't know if, if there is a direct answer about the research. Look, the way we work is, is not research-based. It's not that we say, let's make a research, although we do it. We're interested very much in what we're doing. And Peter published a book about bricks, or we're now busy with another book in relation to transformations. Um, but I think the research we're doing is the, the curiosity within the project. The research we're doing is more based on the project itself to try to understand where we operate. Instead of reacting, Instead of saying, I know it, everything, I will just make, I, don't, I hope I didn't use the word nice in this lecture, but I'll make you something nice. Mm -hmm. um, we don't start there. So because we, as a firm, decided long ago that we would like to work within a certain context, we are operate the best when there is a certain context. And the context doesn't have to be the historical city. Like I showed now, this building is totally not an historical city, and we build in many places outside on the cities, but they always have a situation of the context. And for us, it's very important when we start to start from there. And 
I guess that we try to take as much as possible the time, although in the reality there's always not enough time, to go into this research. But you can also do it in layers. You can do it first about where the building, the historical of the building, and then you go into materials. So within the project, there's also a lot of moments that you go deeper into different levels of the projects. Um, I hope it answers your question. Yes, it did. Yeah. Hi, um, thank you for your lecture. Um, I have a question with respect to um, the um, historic buildings that you work with. So how do you address the aspect of authenticity like when you transform these spaces? For example, um, when you retain a facade or when you change the facade, like in terms of material, so do you re does it question the principles of restoration and preservation? Do you l address that through your design as well or design process? So if I understand the question correctly, the question is if when we change the facade, for example, do we take into consideration the historical importance of it? Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, obviously we, we take a lot of, of uh, uh, all the buildings I showed you, we, we make a lot of historical research about them. And uh, if the historical facade, we don't change them, we actually go back to what it was very often. But if we change something, we do it from understanding why we change it or why we can change it. And if I give you an example, uh, the Trippenhaus, the very big uh, building from 1662, the historical facade, we didn't change at all. It's so historical that we didn't even clean it. But the facade next to it, which was from the 70s, gave us the opportunity to make the change. And I think that's the, again, the word balance that we seek always, is to very, be very clear about what we change and very clear about what not we change. And we do it quite early in the projects. This very simple drawing that I showed you of the department store that looks like nothing, there's a, a lot of thinking about it and a lot of thought about where do we take the freedom to do the changes and where we don't take that freedom, obviously. Okay. Yeah. I also have another question. Sure. It's, um, it's a bit, um, it takes off from Can Kelly's, you talk a bit? Kelly's question, sorry. Um, in the process of your research, before you intervene through design, does it involve, like, when you look at historical buildings, do you go through a process of documentation of the existing structure? Do you map the condition? Yeah, so, um, yes, always. And obviously we don't do it alone. So in a lot of buildings that we work, we work with historians that first doing a documentation for the buildings, which we are not capable to do. They have much more knowledge than us about the historical buildings. So we collaborate with them almost on every project. So they make an uh, historical report of the building. Mm -hmm. We discuss it, but the historical report comes from uh, these very specific uh, uh, historians that study also. Often they studied uh, architecture history, so they are very more theoretical. And we really like to work with them together because actually uh, it gives us the freedom, it goes back to the answer of your former question, by doing it, we have the freedom also to know where we change and what we change and why we're doing it. Uh, but yes, and uh, for example, uh, the 21 layers of the Holocaust Museum, or 29 layers of paint, they are fully documented. Everything is archived, documented, microscope were checked, we took them away because the building was in a really bad shape, which normally you should never take them away, but we did because there was no other choice, but they are documented. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, thank you for the lecture. I very much enjoy your final note and then it's nice that <laughs> this picture show up again. Um, so I'm currently studying in the Belache. We have 14 people in our generation and how we work is very different because we collectively work on one project. So in a sense that um, we do work in a very uh, collective and collaborative mode and I really, 
I also think that for design firms, you mentioned that you, in your firm, you do furniture, from furniture to interior design to architecture. And the collaboration, I trust that in that process is also very much integrated. How the decisions are made are very much communicated through different um, aspects. And I do wonder how you, your firm specifically, work with that kind of interdisciplinary and interpersonal relationship. Like, yeah, I'm just curious about that. Yeah. Um, uh, we try uh, to work uh, non-hierarchical. Obviously, uh, uh, there is always a hierarchy, unfortunately, but, but we try as much as possible not to have it. Actually, to the outside, it's always important for them, but for us internally, we try not to have it as much as it's possible. Um, and we work uh, in teams, obviously, like every other office, so I don't think that's different. But we also criticize each other quite a lot. Uh, and Petra and I, every Monday we meet uh, with different teams on the projects and we criticize each other. So the critique that you guys are doing here, we're doing to each other and sometimes it's not so easy. Um, but we do it with a team that is work on the projects. So um, we try as much as possible to integrate different people within the process, but also to allow ourselves and others to be critique. So he critiques me, I critique him, and etc. cetera, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, I think, I hope it does answer your question a little bit. But it's obviously it, different phases of the project, different scales, different types of teams. Sometimes you have a smaller project and the team is very small. Sometimes you have a larger project and the team is very big. Um, our teams are never very, very big. We try to work with people that are multidisciplinary. So it's not that you're doing only that thing and you're only good in that and you only do that. Most of the people in our team uh, are able to do quite a lot of things, which is great, but on the same time, yeah, you have to make sure that you allow them to develop and to give them the possibility to, to grow within being multidisciplinary. And that's, that's quite complex, actually. Yeah. Do you have any tips on how to critique? How to critique? Yes. Mm. <laughs> In a construct. Not a tip that I can say like that, but... Uh, I, uh, I think, I believe that in every critique, in every thing, you can find uh, an interesting way to look at it. So I always try, if we critique, is to come actually from the interesting part of it, from what do you find in it, and then from there go to why this is working or not working, instead of going to why this thing is not work. But I think it's a very personal uh, thing, and it also depends on the dynamic of the, uh, the group and the situation. But I think critique, just in the sake of critique, uh, it's a bit pity, because in everything you do, there is something in it. And even if there's nothing in it, you can go from what there is in it and then explain why it's not. It's like the restoring uh, monument. Uh, you can change it, but you need to know why you're changing it. And I think that's important to appreciate that. Uh, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> there's one there. Yes, first of all, thank you for the amazing lecture. I was just wondering, small little question, um, this whole idea of continuation and finding the balance with the context, how would you put that in, the, in a bigger frame? I mean, because it's a suiting idea, the, the idea of contextualizing and being humble to your surroundings, mm -hmm. but sometimes I wonder why do we do that? How, how is that a reaction to our times, or, or a representation of what we want to approve? Uh. Yeah, you can answer this question from many angles. It's a very interesting question. I mean, we live in an era that everything has to be wow and iconic, and that's how I started the lecture. You probably look today on many icons on your phones. Um, but I think the city and, and, and inhabitants and the way we operate is not necessarily uh, moving from an icon to an icon. Um, and I think um, that <laughs> it's funny because we say obviously a lot of time that the architecture is not visible, but it's not true to say that because if you look on our project or the building I show you, I tried not to show too many nice images, but they are very visible. 
So to say that the architecture is not visible, that would be wrong to say. But it's visible in a certain layer that allows this, the city stronger than the architecture that we make. And I think we accept that. And uh, I think that goes back to the beginning of my lecture that I, I, I started to, I, I showed something around the building instead of talking about the building to just say that at the end of the day, there is this dynamic that is very important. And I think uh, we want to be part of it. It's not that we want to create an invisible architecture. We are not a restoration architect, totally not. Uh, we are not uh, people that will go to a 16th century uh, ceiling and will start to, re that, that's not work within our architecture. We do look for the renewing. We do look for what is the, but, but within a very clear understanding. So, but you're right, a lot of times people would walk next to the building. And uh, I mean, I, I had to present the, the, the department store for, for uh, a selection of a prize. And I explained the whole building, like I explained to you today, how much effort we make and how nice it is. And at the end, the, the jury, the person, she looked at me and said, yeah, but where is Winhof? I don't see your signature. And I said, yeah, sorry, if you say that, then we don't speak the same language. And there is no signature. I, I, the whole thing is that thing, and I don't need to make another signature on top of it. But sometimes it is necessary. Sometimes we do need to do it, and we are doing it. So I don't know how to answer your question, to be honest. I'm sorry. I think it's, it's a, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a sensitive thing. But I just don't think we need, um, yeah, I know in school, you, a lot of time we learn to make icons and we need to make the next thing. Yeah, maybe to just continue on that, um, I, I come from Flanders, uh, and in, the, in Flemish architecture schools, especially in Antwerp, we have this tendency also across like all kinds of studios to design very, very humble uh, against the context. Sometimes, to me, a little bit too humble even, that the building disappears in the context. Um, mm. And it is always treated as a given, as like, like a paradigm, as an idea that is not questioned enough sometimes. Um, and that, that's why the, that, that interest came uh, yeah. to, to ask that question. Um, no, we definitely don't want to be invisible. So yeah. that's, that's, not, that's not our architecture. No. No. We, are, we, are, we are visible. But as a second, maybe when you look again, yeah, maybe not in your face. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's quite important. Yeah. Oh, there's over there. Oh. Hello. Thank Hi. you for the lecture. This is kind of a follow-up to that question, but I was really interested by that alley project, and you mentioned the amount of work that goes into doing nothing and um, how difficult it can, it can be, and maybe what is the feeling in a project like that? Um, yeah, doing nothing, is it like debilitating for it to be that m amount of work, or is it kind of exciting to work on a project like that? I think we did a lot. <laughs> so I think the word nothing, and I use it obviously myself, um, is to emphasize on actually how much it is. But it is, again, going on that question, it is less visible. Yeah, that's true. If you walk in that alley, you will see, oh, this building is renovated. Maybe it's nice or not nice. It's up to you. But you would not see, OK, there is a, a, a tremendous architecture gesture there. But I'll tell you, to convince a client to lose the most expensive square meters of the Netherlands and to give it back to the city, that's doing a lot. And sometimes our role is different than just making another icon. Yeah. And I, yeah, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's fascinating, actually. It's, it's something that is much longer than, than us. It's, uh, yeah, we always try to make a temple, huh? But it is, there's many of them along the way. Yeah. You cannot control them, huh? I mean, somebody else in one year can change that again. So, well, we try to work on monuments so they cannot change too much, but they could, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I think there was a question there uh, above. Uh, thank you for my part as well for the for the amazing lecture okay. um, I wanted to ask about something that was even if you didn't speak about it explicitly 
You didn't speak about it explicitly, but it was uh, evident in uh, everything you discussed. Uh, your office, for many decades, has a, a tradition in um, uh, establishing architectural culture by making websites with heroes, by making books, mm -hmm. by uh, in inviting others to, to lecture mm -hmm. on, uh, on your initiative. Um, why do you see that as a as a as a, an objective or a duty for an architectural office? Hmm. Maybe that's How important is answer. it? Um, uh, yes, you're right. It's a very interesting question. We 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 since years we we are trying to do much more than making buildings, and we talk about it in Pet and I, and with our team also a lot. And we started indeed local heroes years ago, and a lecture series, and we are teaching also a lot. And I'm involved in committees and things like this, because, um, first of all, because it's really interesting. It makes for us more exciting to do things. But I think also our work is, deals a lot about sharing what we are doing. And I think if I may speak for both of us and our team, the idea of sharing is very interesting for us. For example, when we finish a building, we always invite people for excursions to show them, not to show them just how nice the building is, obviously we want to do that as well, but we invite them during the construction to share actually the things we looked at, the struggles we have, the ideas we had. Um, I think we find it very interesting to, uh, architecture is, is beyond just a building, it's, it's and obviously you, you all know it, but it's, um, um, yeah, it's about a collective thing, what we are doing. I said, well, you see this image, and I said also, we, we don't do anything alone. So I think for us, it's very important to try to share this knowledge. And it started indeed by local heroes, where we saw that there's a lot of architects that are totally not famous and that are very, very important in the local uh, communities of architecture. And somehow, every time we make a local hero, then ETH uh, makes a book after that. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and, and then now it goes into a lecture series to invite people that we find very interesting to talk. Yeah, I think it's really uh, to look on the wider aspect of our profession, which is, it is beyond making a building, or it is beyond this nice image and then next. So, but I think when we go for a drink, you can ask him Peter, he will answer <laughs> it uh, differently probably. Anyone else? Well, thank you, Rudy. Welcome.